So there has been this recognition um, that despite optimal recanalization by mechanical thrombectomy, a sizable proportion of the patients still suffer death or disability. So despite our ability to open occluded blood vessels with mechanical devices, we still, I mean, we have improved a lot. I mean, no question that the death and disability has reduced considerably, but still a burden of death and disability is there. So, you know, there's not a lot of room in opening these medium-sized arteries. I mean, we are already approaching 90% recanalization. So the question has been that another factor that determines whether the brain tissue actually gets blood flow is what's happening in the small arteries and microvessels. And there is actually increasing level of data that the, there are persistent occlusions in these small vessels uh, that actually are preventing adequate blood flow to reach the areas of the brain and reverse ischemia. And mechanical devices are not going to be able to change that. So then the question is that what can be done as an adjunct to mechanical devices, and that's what intraarterial thrombolysis is, giving high concentration of thrombolytics to catheters that are already in the target blood vessels with the hope that you can promote or remove some of these occlusions that are actually blocking flow in these small blood vessels and the capillaries. And uh, basal artery occlusion or posterior circulation strokes is uh, somewhat unique because if you look at intravenous thrombolysis, the risk of actually having intracerebral hemorrhage is lower when the stroke is actually in the basal artery distribution. So there was actually a need that there is some studies that have already looked at intraarterial thrombolysis and internal carotid artery occlusions and middle severe artery occlusions. So there was a need to specifically look at basal artery occlusions. And uh, attention is a large multi-center study uh, or it's a random registry that has been done in China. So it has accrued data on uh, a large proportion of patients, but it's also collected data on who actually received intraarterial thrombolysis. And Granted that this is not a randomized comparison, so the use of intraarterial thrombolysis is somewhat selective and really dependent on the discretion of the operator. So most likely, intraarterial thrombolysis was used when recanalization could not be established with standard mechanical devices. So you're already studying a group of patients that are somewhat at higher likelihood for death or disability. Uh, but interestingly, when you do the analysis, I mean, it's some things actually were very promising. One, you're not really seeing a large amount of intracerebral hemorrhage. So, because that has always been the concern that thrombolytics may increase the risk of intracerebral hemorrhage post thrombectomy. Uh, but we didn't see that uh, in this large analysis. We also saw that um, despite the fact that the recanalization rates were different, and that's probably a selective use that intraarterial thrombolysis is more likely to be used in patients who weren't getting optimal recanalization of mechanical devices. But if you look at their outcomes at 90 days, we don't really see a difference. So that was actually very promising that despite a group of patients at higher likelihood of death or disability getting intraarterial thrombolysis, but nonetheless, when they compare it to their peers or the other group that actually did not get intraarterial thrombolysis, there is no difference in death or disability at 90 days. So I think that you know it's not uh, conclusive data, but it actually does provide a greater level of evidence that we need to study this question in more detail. And perhaps randomized clinical trials are necessary. Uh, so we may have a potentially valuable adjunct to mechanical thrombectomy, but obviously the risk-benefit ratio needs to be evaluated.